Well, we still have a few folks joining us, but I, I think we'll go ahead and get started just uh, because we want to take advantage of the time that we have. Um, appreciate everybody being with us today. We're very pleased and grateful on this 2020 White Cane Awareness Day to have with us Dr. Glenn C. Cockrum. Um, he's the Department of Veterans Affairs National Program Director of Ophthalmology Services. Um, Dr. Cockrum is based in Palo Alto, California, and so he'll be addressing us from there this morning or afternoon, if you're where I am. Um, during his current appointment, Dr. Cockrum has also served as the Acting Chief Consultant in Specialty Care Services at the VA Central Office in Washington. Uh, he was also the Interim D Deputy Director at the DOD VA Vision Center of Excellence in 2015 and 2016. Um, prior to becoming National Program Director, he was the Chief of Eye Care Service in the VA Palo Alto Healthcare System in 2011 and 2012, and the Chief of Ophthalmology in the same system from 2004 to 2011. Um, Dr. Cockrum has a list of peer-reviewed publications, published abstracts, um, committees he's worked on and work groups that he's served on, contributions to book chapters, invited lectures, national presentations, journal reviews, and courses that are like a mile long. <laughs> He first earned a Bachelor of Science from the University of Mississippi and then a Doctor of Medicine from the University of Mississippi School of Medicine in Jackson um, with residencies at the Air Force Medical Center, um, at Andrews Air Force Base, and at Walter Reed. Uh, Dr. Cockrum has been very supportive of BVA's mission and activities on a number of different levels over many years, so we greatly appreciate him joining us today. Uh, we do have a second portion of the program. Um, with a representative of Envision America. We'll introduce him a little bit later. So please stay with us following Dr. Cockerham. Um, also, we anticipate time for some questions after Dr. Cockerham's remarks, uh, if he's able to take those questions. Uh, when that time comes and whenever it's possible, um, use the raise hand or chat functions in Zoom, if you can do that at that time and, and we'll call on you. Um, so without any more delay, um, we'll go ahead and turn the time over to Dr. Cockerham. Well, good morning. It's good morning here in California, at least. I hope you can hear me fairly well. Um, my wife says it's hard not to hear me, so hopefully you can hear me fairly well. And it's a pleasure. I always enjoy doing this. This is the first time I've had to do it uh, remotely like this, and I, I miss the camaraderie. I miss the meetings. I miss having a chance to talk to you. I miss the excellent speakers you have. And I wish we could do this face-to-face, -face, so maybe next year we can. I can only hope so, but uh, anyway. We'll do the best we can. Uh, I've had to totally redo this talk, um, which is not surprising because there have been a lot of disruptions this year in, in everything. So there's no reason we shouldn't have had to change the talk as well. Uh, how can I advance this? Come on. Let's see. Returns not working. That's not working. Uh, hmm. I don't, here we go. This gets frozen, I guess. Let's go back to the beginning. All right, now it's working. Uh, so a little bit about ophthalmology. You know, most, a lot of people, even in medicine, don't understand what ophthalmology is and they can almost never spell it. Uh, but basically we're the people that do surgery and laser and medical care for the eye. We work very closely in the VA with our partners in optometry and, and blind rehab uh, and low vision. Uh, so we're part of the spectrum of eye care. We're all a big team. Uh, ophthalmology itself is located at 115 clinics uh, in the VA. So that's a fairly large portion of all the medical centers that are in the VA. Um, 89 of those are affiliated with uh, medical centers, civilian medical centers, like here, for instance, at Stanford. Um, we have a very close relationship with Stanford in this area. Uh, the structure of the ophthalmology clinics is, uh, and the programs is that we tend to have an academic affiliate at most places, like I mentioned in the majority, and there's usually a county a hospital that's associated with training as well, and in, this, in, in our area, it's the Santa Clara, Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, which also trains, so it's kind of a three-legged stool uh, as far as our approach to ophthalmology in the VA. We have over 1,400 ophthalmologists, and some of them are full-time like me, and some of them are part-time, work half-time or two-thirds. Some are getting paid uh, 
and they're not either full-time or part-time. Some don't get paid at all. A lot of those are with the uh, academic centers that we affiliate with. They'll come over to the VA a day or half day a week and, and work with the residents and work with the veterans. So we're a little over 1,400 out of a total workforce of 26,000 uh, physicians in the VA. Okay, let's advance here. I don't know why this is hanging up. All right, so, so like I said, I'm changing the way this is working. Um, this is a new topic, obviously, the year in review and particularly COVID. So we'll start with COVID-19 since that's been the big news and, and the big factor in VA care this year. And we'll see how COVID-19 has affected some of the other things I normally talk about, such as access and productivity in ophthalmology, uh, its effect on our training program. As I just mentioned, we have training programs with the academic affiliates that's been very much affected by COVID. And then we'll talk about some more routine things that has happened that I think are important in ophthalmology. So I think the VA has been a leader in COVID management. The senior leadership in VA jumped on this right away and partnered with CDC and FDA and implemented all the best practices that we could find from civilian medical organizations. And they enabled and charged the program directors like me to, to search the best guidelines for care in our own domain. So uh, we use Centers for Disease Control guidelines for personal protective equipment, for testing, for disinfection, for physical distancing, all the things you hear about on the news. Uh, in addition, we got information from National Institute of Health for treatment guidelines. We collaborated with the Food and Drug Administration for expanded access to drugs that are normally not available, such as convalescent plasma and remdesivir. And these should ring a bell because these are the two, two things that uh, President Trump got when he was at National Naval Medical Center or Walter Reed, as it's called, I guess these days, Walter Reed Medical Center, not National Naval anymore. But anyway, so this, all of this has been accelerated because of uh, the federal government is allowing us to do things we would normally not be able to do. We also got guidance from our professional societies. So in, in my specialty, we worked very closely with American Academy of Ophthalmology the American Optometric Association, the American College of Surgeons, and the American Medical Association for best practices. For this, this was changing weekly as we've gone through this. Okay. So we've tried to create a VA culture of safety and uh, We'll, we'll, we'll look at a chart to see when actually COVID really kicked in here, but around March 15th is when we started making a lot of changes in VA care. And if you're a patient, you'll be aware of this because you probably were getting messages or, or getting feedback that, that, the, that the clinics are not available for routine care anymore. Again, this started around March 15th. Um, and again, with guidance from our organizations that have previously mentioned, we, did, we instituted across the system that we would not see non-urgent VA care. So non-urgent VA care means it's not an emergency and it can wait. And sometimes those are tough calls and, it, and you might've been part of that, but uh, that's been very difficult. We had to just basically stop normal operations and screen every incoming patient and make a decision. Are we gonna see them now? Are we gonna see them by telehealth? Are we going to, are we going to do a phone call? What can we do? trouble in ophthalmology and optometry is, is that you basically have to see them. You can't really do it over the phone or by telehealth very well. Uh, you can do some things like diabetic screening with a photograph, but for visits, it's not so hard. So we had to postpone those face-to-face -face visits and if possible, at least make a phone call and see how they're doing and try to make a decision. We instituted personal protective equipment. The N95 mask was out of, uh, was not available early in this, so we were scrambling to try to get equipment to stay safe and keep the patient safe. And we instituted all the things we talked about, physical distancing, the environmental cleaning. Um, and we'll talk about, we also instituted eye protection or face shields 
for clinic staff because we found out that the tears themselves may be infectious. So we've instituted that. That's all been instituted now in the VA, but of course that was stepwise. It, these, these were not available commercially uh, when we first started. We also had to put protective shields on our equipment in the eye clinic again because we were concerned about airborne particles as well as tears uh, that, could, that were infectious. So the chiefs of the different departments, including ophthalmology and optometry, met and had to prior, prioritize care. And again, our number one priority was emergent or urgent care. And just to kind of give you a sense of what we had to do to make these decisions, uh, these are some of the categories we decided would be emergent. I mean, they're fairly obvious to us that these are emergencies. If you have trauma with a change in vision or with pain or acute loss of vision, or if you get onsets of flashers, floaters in your vision, or if you have a red eye that can be infectious, particularly if it's painful, or if you have a headache with eye pain, or if you have onset of double vision, or if you have a chemical injury to your eye, you splash lye in it or, or some kind of acid. Or if you're one of our known veterans that has macular degeneration, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, and you report changes. These are all things that we made sure we saw as priority one. Priority two is not quite so urgent. And these are patients who need intraocular injections for diabetic retinopathy. You know, uh, we've instituted shots, uh, intraocular injections for control of diabetic retinopathy, and it's been very successful, but you have to see those patients on a regular basis to give them those shots so that their diabetic retinopathy doesn't flare up. So that was obviously a, 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 an important category for us. And uh, we tried to follow up all the diabetic retinopathy. If we didn't see them in clinic, we expanded the telehealth program so that we didn't lose track of those diabetic retinopathies that we've, patients that we've spent years trying to um, get in our system and get regular care. And there were other categories too, some of our glaucoma patients and our macular degeneration patients and chronic eye diseases in general, we tried to follow. But that leaves priority three, which, come on priority three. It could be my internet's just hanging up. Priority three was considered low risk. And this is routine eye care. Not that it's necessarily routine to the patient getting it, but in the scheme of how we had to schedule this, we had to come up with a category like that. And um, so basically these are patients who just are seen kind of on a regular basis, but they're not have active disease um, or spectacles or contact lens that could be deferred for a while until hopefully we had some control of COVID or just new patients coming into the system that have never been seen. Uh, just that they just got authorization to be seen by VA eye care. Um, so we had to delay those. And uh, we made sure that all these guidelines were updated on a regular basis and communicated to optometry, primary care, emergency medicine, community care, the call center. So every week, this was an ongoing process. It affected our surgery, of course. Um, because we had to decide if surgery was urgent or non-urgent. Um, so all elective surgery procedures were canceled no later. This is, this is directly from the top VA leadership uh, by memo. It said all elective surgical procedures are canceled no later than March 18th. So um, in addition, well, let me just make a comment there. So our big elective surgical procedure in the VA and ophthalmology is cataract surgery. Um, we do a lot of cataract surgery, over 80,000 cases or 80,000 cases a year. And a lot of that is considered routine because it's, uh, it affects your vision, but it doesn't affect your overall health, uh, immediately at least. So that was a big change for us. And we'll see, we'll see the downstream knockdown effects on that too. Uh, certainly, if you, do some, if you make a major change like that in the way you do business, it's going to have downstream effects, as you can imagine. Uh, we also had to institute preoperative COVID-19 testing for any surgery or procedure done in the OR 
And initially it was very, it was not easy to get COVID-19 testing on everybody uh, at that time. We also had to get full PPE uh, in the OR, full, that's personal protective equipment. That means not only the surgical gown, the surgical hat, the surgical gloves, but it means a mask that uh, resist, is resistant to COVID-19 particles. It means goggles or shields. Um, sometimes um, we had to do negative pressure. If the patient was a known suspected COVID patient, and depending on the type of surgery, we had to have a negative pressure operating room, which meant that the airflow cannot flow out of the room. So if you open the door in a negative pressure room, the air flows in so that COVID airborne particles will not get out of the room and go somewhere else in the hospital. Now, typically we don't have very many of those rooms in a VA hospital, maybe one or two. So that really constrained what we were able to do in surgery at that time. Uh, there's a category we had to sit down to with optometry and, and uh, our team and decide what procedures generate particles that can be infectious. These are called aerosol generating uh, procedures, aerosol generating eye procedures in our case. So we had a work group and we had to again look at best practices from FDA, CDC and everything uh, in NIH. Uh, and so these require, again, full protective gear and maybe a negative pressure room. And some of the just the routine things we do, uh, like an air puff tonometry, could conceivably generate particles from the eye surface. So some of the lasers we do were a concern. Uh, so again, we had to just kind of reconfigure, stop doing those for a while till we got a better sense of who was infectious and who wasn't. Now, at the eyeball level itself, what happens to the eye in COVID-19? Well, even early on in Wuhan, we knew what actually one of the first people to die from COVID-19 in China was an ophthalmologist who was seeing patients. And he commented that a lot of the patients with COVID-19 had red eyes, conjunctivitis, like this picture here is a picture of a red eye. A red eye can be from a lot of things, contact lens overwear or allergies. But in the concept, uh, in the context of someone who's febrile and uh, has symptoms consistent with COVID, if they have red eyes like this, it's a, it's a warning sign that they may have an involvement of their eye and they may be infections. So they did in fact prove that tears contain the infectious virus. And we notified the VA of that, uh, again, through our work group. And so the Dusham, which is the Deputy Undersecretary of Health for Operations and Management sent out a memo uh, called VHA Eye Care Operations During COVID-19 Pandemic. And this was March 24th. So this was about a week later after we started shutting down. And we notified all the VA healthcare workers that conjunctivitis is known as a sign of COVID infections and that tears should be considered infectious and that they can also be airborne. So again, this reinforces the need for the goggles and the shields. So we got that message out early to the workforce. Sorry for the delay. I don't know why this is such, but so far it's working just slow. Uh, in addition to conjunctivitis, which doesn't necessarily hurt your eye, it's just, it's just the, the big concern with the conjunctivitis is not that the conjunctivitis will rob you of your vision because it goes away as the COVID goes away, but that it's, it's a source of infection. But there is something else that's worrying us and it's called multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And it's not published well yet because people are still, we're still getting feedback from the clinics uh, across the country and around the world um, we're seeing it in fairly young people. It was originally described as a disease of children uh, and is similar to toxic shock syndrome, which was reported in Europe with COVID. And it occurs two to four weeks after onset of COVID in children. Now, they're, de they're defining children as up to age 20, children and adolescents. There's been, as of 
about a month ago, there were 565 cases in the United States of this multi-system inflammatory disease, which tested positive for COVID. Um, again, the range is from two weeks of age to 20 years, but we're getting feedback that it's, that it's in an older population as well, young adults uh, who may be in their 20s or even 30s are coming in. About half of those have conjunctivitis, but that's not the concern. The concern is that this, this is a deadly disease because about half have died. I'm sorry, half have required I ICU care and a several percent have died. They have cardiac involvement and shock. And um, again, they have orbital inflammation and scleritis. So this is a disease that's evolving. It, it seems to be associated with COVID uh, in the majority of the cases. And again, they can they get very sick. Even young, healthy adults wind up in the ICU on a ventilator. And this was a, a report from CDC in August 14, 2020. Uh, so two months ago, apparently, uh, approximately. And so this is still, again, this is an evolving thing that we're watching. And we don't have 15 year olds, obviously, in the VA, but we, we may have people in their 20s or 30s that could be affected. So I've kind of given you an overview of how we've had to change, drastically change operations in the VA starting in March. So what does that do to our access? Because one of the metrics that the VA is very concerned with, with as our population grows is that we are able to see them on time. And uh, we're monitored on that on a regular basis. But obviously with those uh, instituting those kind of procedures and processes I just mentioned, uh, and not seeing routine surgery or patients is going to affect us. So this is a graph, this is a chart that shows ophthalmology access from fifth fiscal year 14 to fiscal year 20, which just ended. And we had steady growth in the uh, unique encounters, um, 1.2 million, 1.29 million in 14, 1.32 million in 15, 1.37, 1.45. So it grew steadily until fiscal year 20. Uh, in fiscal year 19, we saw almost 1.5 million patients in ophthalmology, and in 20, we saw less than uh, less than a million. It went from a million and a half to less than a million, and that makes sense from when we had to cut back clinical operations. So here, here just shows it in exactly from from from. 19 to, to 20, it, it, the percent change was 40%, 38.8%, essentially 40%. We had to cut back our, our access seeing patients. It's 40% of people that wanted to be seen or needed to be seen did not get seen in 20. And here's a bar graph that shows it. It shows it by pay period. This was fiscal year 20. And it shows that every two weeks we have a pay period, just like in the military. It's the same system where we get paid starting um, one January. The pay system is not based on uh, the October system we normally use for the fiscal year. So this shows pay period uh, six, which is around March 15th. It shows a huge drop off in ophthalmology productivity. It looks like a two third drop off. And that even got lower over the next pay periods. And then it started climbing up around pay period 12, 14. And we're still about a third down from where we were. So again, that's just a graph that shows the reduced reduction in volume. So if we're reducing clinic volume, we also had to reduce surgical volume. I think I already mentioned that. And just by way of comparison, we did, uh, I said 80,000. It was right around 78,000 cataracts in 2019. And in 2020, we did 44,000. So that's a 43% reduction in cataract surgery. Uh, veterans who qualified visually for cataract surgery, but were not able to get it. So one of the ways we tried to approach this, as I mentioned, was with telehealth. Telehealth has 
some limitations in an eye care exam because we have to use magnifying equipment and stuff to really see the eye or look inside the eye. But there are things we can do with telehealth and we did expand it. Um, part of this is legal uh, or policy is that we're, we don't have to have a license in any particular state if we're in the VA system to, to see patients in that state. And that obviously is essential to have a telehealth reader somewhere, say in Livermore, California, and he or she is reading uh, diabetic retinopathy photographs from Oregon. So obviously that's a law that was required and it is the law now allows any licensed VA provider to provide treatment at any location with any, within any state. So it's no longer a factor where the veteran is or where the provider is. And it says specifically, this act shall supersede any state law, any law of any state, et cetera, et cetera. So I mentioned the reduction in clinic and in surgical volume. So one of the knockdown effects, downstream effects, is this clearly affects US medical education because of the prominent role that the VA plays in training across not only medical students, but all the residencies. Uh, as far as uh, overall residencies in, uh, in medical schools that participate in them, 94% uh, of allopathic schools, those are just what do we call standard medical schools, 94% 90, have relationships, have academic affiliations with VA and over 90% of the osteopathic medical schools. So, so a lot of medical schools have a lot of their students training at VAs. If, if you've been in the VA, you've noticed that. You've probably seen a resident uh, in some of the clinics. So every year, 40,000 U.S. residents rotate through over 10,000 positions, funded positions that are in VAs. Typically, there'll be three month rotation. So that works out that if you have 10,000 positions, you have 40,000 residents yearly. 70% uh, of all US physicians have received some of their training in VA facilities. And the VA has a very robust program uh, with their, the Office of Academic Affairs that manages this. Uh, and there's over $1.4 billion transferred from VA to academic centers. So we're we're, we subsidize and fund and train uh, the residents uh, for the academic centers and, and we're an essential part of education as well as emergency contingency plans in the United States. So VA is not just, uh, not just patient care, but it has other roles. Now, as far as the ophthalmology training, we have 89 VA eye care programs out of a uh, out of 115 clinics. We I said earlier, we have 115 clinics in the VA. Almost 90 of those uh, are affiliated with academic centers. Um, there's 119 ophthalmology residencies that use the VA. So we have more residencies that use it than physicians uh, programs. And it's, that's because some, some of the VAs have more than one academic center coming in sending residents. So it's 119 residencies in the U.S. use VA, and it rotates through about 90 medical centers. We have 350 medical uh, positions that are funded for ophthalmology, and 1,200, uh, I'm sorry, 12, 1,200 residents rotate through yearly. So they receive a large part of their training in the VA, and this is a picture of the academic affiliate that we're affiliated with at VA Palo Alto. This is a picture of the Stanford I Institute. It's a new building that Stanford built just for ophthalmology. It's very state of the art. So one of the things that drives us is quality. Uh, and that's been a high priority for many years. The Secretary of the VA establishes the quality standards for VA. Um, and they have several programs in, inside of VA that, that monitor this and, and, and make sure it's current. And they consider existing public and private health quality measures. Uh, and internally, we coordinate with the DOD and the Center for Medicare Services and Health and Human Services and other organizations 
so that we kind of um, harmonize our, our quality measures. We, use, we try to use established measures that are used across other systems so that we can benchmark and compare ourselves. Uh, part of this is the survey that we send to veterans about how they view their care. And we do, we do something similar within the VA to all the providers called, it's called the All Employee Survey about what we think of the care. So we're asking the veterans, we're asking ourselves, how can we do this better? And the things we're interested in are the timeliness of care, which are why those access me measures were so important to us that certain people would be seen within 30 days or 60 days or 90 days. And of course, we saw that COVID kind of blew that up. Uh, we're also concerned with effectiveness of care, safety of care, and efficiency of care. So what the VA has instituted uh, is a rating system where we check ourselves against outside care. And this is uh, the, the uh, broker for that is called Hospital Compare. And uh, has a website here. If anybody would be interested in it, I can give it to you. Um, so Hospital Compare is how hospitals compare themselves to other hospitals and the benchmarks. Internally, we have the VHA quality of care which is an internal source for how we're doing. And then of course the Joint Commission uh, inspects us every, every so often. Now, if you can check your own VA medical center because this is very transparent. This is from Access to Care. This is access to care.va.gov slash healthcare. And I just Googled uh, just on a civilian computer, the Palo Alto VA Medical Center where I work. And this is uh, the, the latest. It says State California Facility VA Medical Center Palo Alto and the quality measure is the overall rating of the hospital. So this is the overall rating for Palo Alto VA. And we ranked four out of nine and higher is better. So we're kind of middle of the pack. Then it compares us to all the hospitals in the area. So there's a bar graph here. And it, again, we're right in the middle of it. Um, Higher, higher number is better. The highest number in the Bay Area is Menlo Park Surgical Hospital at 84, and then the Kaiser Foundation is 80, and Mills Peninsula is 79, and Palo Alto is tied at 79. And I don't, I hope nobody from Stanford is on the phone call, but actually the VA Palo Alto outranked Stanford Healthcare. Stanford Healthcare was only 76, and uh, San Mateo Medical Center was a little lower. So we we're in the middle of the pack there, uh, rating ourselves, and we do that on a regular basis, and so do all VA hospitals. And the staff at the hospital, particularly leadership quad staff, is, uh, is judged based on how their hospital does on those measures. In ophthalmology, we've been very interested in optometry as well, very interested in trying to benchmark ourselves against equivalent civilian benchmarks. And we are finally starting that process. Um, we have what's called focused and ongoing professional practice evaluations where all practitioners um, are measured against, again, national standards. So it allows us to benchmark. And the national standards that we use are created by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality under the CMS. Uh, uh, and also we use guidelines from American Academy of Ophthalmology and so forth. We can use any of those measures uh, to try to benchmark ourselves. And so we have five measures that we instituted this last year, uh, which are, we, these are things we, we are, are hoping to achieve. Cataract is 2040 better a vision at 90 days. So three months after cataract surgery, the, to, to meet that measure, we have to have the veteran have 20, 40 or better vision at 90 days. Uh, we also are concerned if we have to return to the OR within 30 days, because that means that's probably, that's an unplanned visit. And so that's something we track. And for people with macular degeneration, we want to have documentation of their examinations in the chart so that we can make sure they're being seen. Uh, same with glaucoma, that they've had an optic nerve exam within 12 months. And again, COVID is knocking us down on this year, so I don't know how we're going to perform, but our goal is to meet these measures. And lastly, there's a laser procedure uh, that we also 
mark ourselves against. Okay, so that's COVID and, and quality. So switch gears real quick. One of the big, uh, big programs for us before COVID came along was the modernization, which is the electronic health record. That is to replace VISTA and CPRS. And we partnered with Cerner, as many of you know. Um, Cerner had already set up a relationship with the DOD and it transitioned DOD from their in-house records to, to their system. And so over the past few years, we've had an eye care council, the eye care work group, which is ophthalmology, optometry, and informaticists and some pharmacists. And we meet on a regular basis weekly, or were at least, to, um, to make sure that we're consistent with DOD processes and also to build our own. And we had to stand down. Uh, this is how seriously the VA leadership took COVID. We had to temporarily stand down from April to July. It's only, I guess, two or three months. But uh, we were on a tight schedule because we have a go live date, which means we're going to roll out the system, the Cerner Health System for eye care and all the other specialties too, all at the same time. We're scheduled for October 23rd, which is about a week from now, uh, to go live at Mann Grand Staff VA Medical Center in Spokane. Um, so we're, even with the stand down for three months, we're still trying to make that deadline. I, I, well, we're going to make it. I mean, the teams have already, are already headed to Spokane for the big show. So we'll see. There is an optometry and an ophthalmology clinic in Spokane. So we'll be able to see how well we do in, in that situation. But this is a multi-year project and man grand staff is just the first of a long line of rollouts. So later, Seattle VA will go live and then eventually it'll come down uh, to other states and other visions. Okay. So another big issue for us is community care. I think most of you probably know that the VA was not able to meet their access measures. Those, you know, can a patient be seen within a certain period of time? And the solution to that was to expand care outside of the VA, which we call community care. And um, so we've been working with that for several years. And that's going well. I mean, we've some of the overflow of patients we weren't able to see in the last few months has gone to community care, and they've been able to expand their volume to to incorporate that as as well as us using telehealth and telephone calls and stuff to try to manage it. Um, but we wanted to make sure one of the things the quality another quality measure I was interested in is. Do patients in community care get the same level of care that they get within the VA? And we were aware that, that in the VA, veterans are able to get a particular type of intraocular lens, which corrects astigmatism. And about 15% of veterans need this extra correction because if you just get the standard intraocular lens for cataract surgery in the VA, and you don't get the, get the astigmatism component to it, you'll still need glasses probably uh, for, for near and far. Whereas a toric lens, it's called a toric lens, corrects astigmatism. And even though it's not uh, on the CMS contract for, for federal facilities, we instituted that several years ago because it's considered essential for resident training. So make a long story short, if you were a veteran in the VA and you got cataract surgery, you could get that type of lens uh, just as a matter of routine, but you could not get that type of lens in community care because uh, the rules were such, it was not that anybody was trying to be mean or to withhold care, but the guidance in community care was that we could not provide a service that's not covered by Medicare. And the toric and the astigmatism correcting lens is not. But we got together and got together with VA leadership. We got the ethics department involved. Um, we got community care leadership who were very receptive to this. 
And we agreed that you can't have a system where you got two levels, two types of care. You can't have a veteran get one type of care at one facility and not at another. So uh, fortunately, we, it's going to cost us extra money. The VA is going to have to pay the additional price out of their pocket, but the VA is willing to do that. And the rule, the new rule for community care was published on October 1st, which was three weeks ago, that that now will be allowed. So I'm happy that that's happened. We're also concerned about uh, how is how was cataract surgery done? What if, if you compare cataract surgery in the VA versus community care, how do we rate? How do they rate? I mean, we didn't know. So one of the measures we use is one of the ones I talked about earlier about um, complications or return to OR. So that has a specific code. So we can go back and look and see how many of these cases had to return to the OR, um, which, which would, uh, be, a be considered a complication. That would be the underlying reason for it. So we looked back, we, the, there's a team uh, in health services research that, work that we worked with, um, and this was just published this year that looked at cataract surgeries. It goes all the way back to fiscal year 15 because it's hard to get the data. I mean, and you have to work, you have to have uh, analysts to deal with it. But anyway, we compared, long story short, we compared surgery in the VA to community care and they had a low complication rate in both, but it's very similar. So less than 1% complication rate, and there were no differences between community care and the VA. So that's nice to know. And we've also reviewed glaucoma surgical practices in the VA um, this year. And it seems that we're providing the appropriate care as far as we can tell. And the last thing I wanna mention is that um, we have a directive, which is uh, called the Eye and Vision Care Directive, which work, uh, which is um, our guidance for optometry and ophthalmology. And we just republished this in this fiscal year back in October. Uh, and that's the only directive we have. We had a prior directive, which was laser procedures, and we incorporated that into this, this one. And so that's been up to date. And so it's been a busy year all around. And fiscal year 20 was very challenging. Uh, we had a global pandemic. We had shortages of masks. We had shortages of disinfection. We didn't know exactly what rules we were going to use. We had to drastically reduce capacity while maintaining patient safety and essential services. And the VA used every possible thing they could to deliver care. And we hope that fiscal year 21 will be a little less interesting and then we can get a safe and effective vaccine and get everybody uh, hopefully back to normal and we will continue in the meantime to try to maintain vision and ocular health and public health uh, in our population and that's all I have thank you oh well thank you Dr. Cochram if, do we have a couple of maybe have time for a question or two really quick sure thank you I don't see any any um, money in the chat the chat function to ask a question. But if there's anybody out there that would like to mute them, unmute themselves and and ask a question, we'll we'll definitely take it. Hi, doctor. This is uh, Jim Vale from the Blind Veterans Association. Hey. Um, I, I have a question regarding the complication rate. Um, do you have statistics for the complication rate for um, uh, veterans who have RP who have have the uh, the lens replaced. Um, I don't have it at my fingertips. We'd have to set up a, a search to go into the records and do that. But would you be okay? Can I just have that? Absolutely. I have RP, and and I've uh, uh, been told that the uh, uh, you know your the eye is already inflamed due to the RP, and then you and then the surgery causes inflammation, so you have inflammation on inflammation, and that can really complicate the, uh, uh, the surgery. Okay, so you're talking, so the question is, uh, complications, cataract uh, in patients with RP, and so the two measures we check are return to OR within 30 days, uh, which would probably be what you're uh, alluding to, or visual outcomes at 90 days. Those are the two things we check. 
um, we can go in and cross check that against the RP diagnosis code, I believe. That would be great. Let's see if we can pull that. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Maybe we, if we can take maybe one more of anybody Stuart. out there could just unmute themselves and, and go ahead. Yes, yeah, Stuart, this is Kevin Jackson. May I ask a question, please? Sure. Yes, thank you, Dr. Carkin, for the great information that you provided us with. My question to you as an ophthalmologist, and thank you, thank you for sharing the COVID-19 information that you have, but as an ophthalmologist, from what I understand, COVID-19 is a virus that does wind up in a bloodstream. Have you seen any changes into someone's overall visual system, whether it be inside the eye, the optic nerve, the visual cortex? Have you seen any negative effects at all on an optic system that could have been induced by COVID-19? The no, to answer your direct question about the eyeball itself, no. The, the multi-system inflammatory syndrome uh, I mentioned um, that I mentioned 500 and something cases that were published there. People are reporting that it's like a orbital inflammation, like a nonspecific or orbital inflammation in SOI where it can affect the optic nerve. So it's still, you know, it's still not even fully reported, but it seems to be evolving that, that, that the optic nerve can be affected. Inside the eye, we haven't. We haven't seen the retina or, the, uh, or anything, but um, again, these are young. So far, they're fairly young. Um, even if it got up into the 20-year-olds, I don't know that we'd have too many. We'd, we'd have a few in the VA that are polytrauma patients that were wounded and uh, in their, you know, and, and using VA services in their 20s. So it's possible we'll see it. Well, I haven't yet, but we're aware that it could happen, so. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Cockrum. That was um, very comprehensive, and I certainly didn't have any idea about the effect of COVID-19 on, on the eyes. You don't hear that in the, in the mainstream of, of the news, and I, I just, I did not know that. But uh, we really appreciate you being with us, and um, Look forward to the time when you can meet with us in person. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and move on to part two today. Um, we've got Richie Lefebvre with us from Envision America. And uh, Richie, you've, um, I, you're still there, I, I think, hopefully. I am here, Stuart. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Okay, great. We'll just we'll wait until Dr. Cockrum gets his down. Yep. Oh, okay. okay. Um, gonna... There we go. We got it up now. So let me just do a really so. quick little um, introduction of, um, of Richie. Um, we're pleased to have him with us today. He's going to brief us um, on the recently released script talk station 2.0. Um, Envision America, as most, a lot of you guys know, um, has been really supportive of BVA over the years. Um, they've um, sponsored a lot, lots of our events at the conventions, and, and they're one of our sponsors of um, these presentations today. So really appreciate Richie being with us. He's a native of the state of Maine. Um, he joined Envision America approximately four years ago on the sales side of the business, and he quickly transitioned into the role of Veterans Affairs Account Manager, which is what he does today. Um, Richie's father is a disabled veteran, so he has some deep roots in the military and in the veteran community. Um, he moved from base to base as a youth. Um, as Envision America has continued to grow, so has Richie's position with Envision America. Um, some of you might have met him before or know him. Um, his role was recently expanded to take on the responsibilities of international business development. So we'll go ahead and turn the, turn the time over to him. Thanks again, Richie. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Technology is great, right? We can spend the morning in Palo Alto with Dr. Cockrum, and now you're going to be in sunny Florida uh, with me for the, for the next 15, 20 minutes. So um, we're excited. Uh, you know, the, the reason we are here today is we are introducing Script Talk 2.0. Um, it, it's, it's come a long way. You know, we've been, uh, veterans have benefited from 
the Script Talk service for over 15 years now. And this is the third installment of the uh, Script Talk device. So what we'll go over today, uh, it's gonna be, you know, maybe there's some people on here that do not know what Script Talk is. Uh, we're gonna do a brief overview of Script Talk um, and how the unit works. We're gonna talk about the upgrades uh, that have uh, taken place to the actual unit. We'll talk about the Script Talk mobile app that's available now. And then uh, we'll close it out with some questions. So we'll get started. Uh, Script Talk is, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a little video for everybody and kind of gives an overview of, of what Script Talk is and, and how the device works. So here we go. In this video, you'll learn how to use the Script Talk Station Reader to speak the information contained on your medication labels. The Script Talk Station was designed for those who can't clearly read their medication labels. It is a system installed by your pharmacy to help you independently access your prescription information. Talking prescription labels are crucial to ensuring medication safety and independence. Script Talk was designed with tactile buttons and a loudspeaker to give you all your prescription information audibly. You will hear drug name, dosage, instructions, warnings, pharmacy information, doctor's name, prescription number and date, as well as other information. So buckle up and let's learn how to use this wonderful device. First, Script Talk uses a special electronic label placed on your medication container by your pharmacist. This is a free service provided by participating pharmacies. This special label uses RFID or radio frequency identification to relay the vital prescription label information to your Script Talk station. Use the small wheel on the right lip of the machine to turn it on and turn up the volume. Once the machine is on, Press the oval button on the face of the machine in the front center. This is the read button. Once you push the read button, you will hear an audible ticking sound. When you hear this, simply place the bottom of the prescription bottle on the face of your Script Talk station reader. All your prescription label information will be read out loud. You can skip through information or jump back if you miss something. The two triangle buttons on either side of the read button allow you to jump forward or back through your prescription label information. That's all there is to it. Simple, isn't it? If you have an iPhone or Android smartphone, you can also download the Script Talk app to access your prescription information. Now your vital prescription label information is available to you whenever you need it, wherever you need it. If you need assistance finding a pharmacy near you that offers Script Talk, please call Envision America at 1 800 890 1180 or visit www.envisionamerica.com. So that's just a brief overview of Script Talk and how the unit works. Uh, the differences um, of the of the new unit uh, compared, to the, compared to the old unit are, are is this. <clears throat> the newer unit is it's compact and it's extra durable. It's, it's almost a brick. So if it's to be dropped or, um, you know, dinged up at all, it, it's pretty durable. Nothing's going to affect the actual unit itself. Um, we've actually changed the surface on the front. It is now flat instead of curved. I'm not sure if uh, many of you know the old unit, but it had a, a, a like a beveled top to it. So the medication didn't sit flat on it. Now it has a nice flat surface towards the top of the unit uh, with a small rounded speaker on the top. The RFID read range is now four inches. So you don't necessarily have to put it on the device itself. You can start to get it close and the, it will pick up quite easily has an upgraded TTS engine, uh, overall better sound, clarity, and dictation. Uh, this is a really nice feature. It's the same exact, exact buttons uh, for, for the veteran. Um, they don't have to learn a new unit. It will be an easy transition over to this one. 
Another cool feature is it's USB powered. There's no need for an AC adapter. So any old micro USB uh, will be able to charge this unit up. It does take four batteries as well. Um, and when they are shipped out, uh, they have the batteries already installed, ready for use. So those are the main differences. We're pretty excited about it. They have already started rolling out. Um, so maybe some of your veterans, maybe some people on this webinar actually already have the new unit. Uh, but this is the, the unit that we're moving forward with and pretty excited about. Uh, the next thing I want to talk to you guys about is the Talk Mobile app. Uh, do, you got, do you have veterans on the go? If you do, try Script Talk Mobile. It's av available both on the iOS and the Android systems. iPhone 7 or newer. Uh, uh, you, you need an iPhone 7 or newer in order for this to work, as well as Android phones with NFC technology. So any newer Android phone will be able to support the app. It's definitely a reliable backup to the actual reader itself. And it works with or without voiceover. It features a full scan mode and a quick scan mode. It's a little bit different than the old um, script talk app. We actually added a quick scan feature. I'll kind of show you how that works right now. So the first thing I'll show you is the script talk app. You open it up and we're going to do the full scan mode. And you can see that you would place the RFID label near the top of the unit. It quickly picks it up. Patient name, John J. Smith. Medication, amoxicillin 250 mg tablet. Instructions. Take one tablet three times daily. Quantity. 30. Fill date. July 8, 2020. Use by date. July 8, 2021. Prescriber. Dr. Ben Casey. EVA Tech Pharmacy. Pharmacy phone 800-890-1180. Prescription number. 123456. Warning. Important. Finish all this medication unless otherwise directed by prescriber. So it will continue to read all of the warnings out. Now the quick scan mode. Amoxicillin 250 mg tablet. Tylenol 325 milligrams tablet. So every time a medication is presented to the unit during quick scan mode, it'll only read the medication itself. So if there's somebody that only has two or three medications, uh, but it's time to organize, they can scan the one at a time and it just gives the information of what's in the bottle. Scan mode, of course, will read everything uh, from your name down to the last warning, uh, including more information. So that's, it's definitely something that we see uh, being at the future. And, and a lot of people are using this app right now um, on the go. Uh, like I said, the Script Talk 2 has already been shipping out, and that's the next unit that you guys will receive. We're also working on a cool, um, we're working on the ability to reorder medications through the Script Talk app itself. So veterans do not have to go to another app or call the pharmacy. What we're working on with a couple groups right now is the ability to use the Script Talk app and reorder medications directly through that. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, we're really pumped up to, to get some feedback on this unit. And that's, uh, that's the presentation, Stuart. Um, I, like Stuart has said, I, I moved on to international business development. We're taking script talk across the world, which is very exciting as well. Uh, Lindsay Haley is the new contact for, she's the new VA account manager. Her information is listed here, and she's the one to go to for any questions, uh, if, if you may have any. Um, she can send you sample bottles, brochures, whatever you may need. But uh, that's it for me. I, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Richie. Um, so we do have um, one of there's a question in the chat function, and I'll just read that to you. If um, you can't, you, I don't know, you might not be able to see go it. Go right ahead. Anymore, but it says um, it's from Alicia Jarrett. Okay. Um, Let's see, is the pharmacy phone number hyperlinked so that the veteran can tap the phone number in the app to dial out immediately? Not yet, that's one of the features we're adding as well. As we add, you know, keep adding features, that's one of them. 
not available yet. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, we still got a little bit. We can go just a little bit over. If, if you have any other questions out there, I think there's probably are some. Um, yeah, so we have another one right here. Um, Alicia just mentioned, thank you. I worked with Lindsay already and she's the best. Uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> the next question, um, will the new reader still work with the current labels or will veterans need a new reader? It's from Angela Humbertson. Yep, good question. Uh, the old labels, well, I don't wanna say old labels, but the 10K labels that are being used right now at the VA will transition smoothly over to the Script Talk 2. There's, the veterans do not have to worry about anything. Um, especially when they get the new unit, everything will work flawlessly, seamlessly. Hello? Hello? Yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Joe Cooler. I am in Florida. I, I'm a script talk user ever since the first one. Uh, will I be able, the script talk mobile app, what is it called? The, the app itself? That's a good question. Thank you. It's, it's actually two words when you're searching it in both the Google Play Store and the iOS App Store. It's Script Talk Mobile. So Script Talk, one word, and then mobile. And then you'll be able to download it at no cost. So and, uh, one other question, being a veteran, we'd be able to go back to our this coordinator and ask that we want to upgrade to the 2.0? Uh, it's certainly worth the ask. Um, we're just rolling them out as they go. So as, um, you know, new veterans get signed up with Script Talk, those are the ones getting them. Uh, if there's issues with the ones you're having now, uh, that's a good time to do that. Um, yeah. And certainly. one other quick question for you. I'm in Florida now. I just moved to Florida from South Carolina. How, what part of Florida are you in, Richie? <laughs> uh, we're in Palmetto. So we're in between Sarasota and Tampa. Okay, because I'm in Punta Gorda. Oh, perfect. Okay. Usually Thank you. we attend the BVA, uh, Florida, every year. Um, so hopefully we'll see you around. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? I think we, we still got maybe a couple more minutes we could take with, with Richie. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Hello? Yeah, yeah. it's Derek Pollard and, and, and New York. I just wanted to have an old script talk in it. It's just a great device. I really appreciate it. Um, what do we do with the old one uh, if you want a new one? I mean, do um, you hand it back in or what do you suggest? Um, I would just su suggest talking to, to your VIS coordinator uh, directly. Um, you know, if the unit's working and, and functioning properly, uh, there may no, be no reason to, to upgrade right now. Um, but it is, uh, it is something you want to talk to. Um, or raise that question with them, I would say. I just want to have one other additional comment. I love my script talk. I just wanted to thank you. It's just a, a wonderful device, and I, I, it's just wonderful. I, I have RP, so um, I can't read the prescription labels at all. But mm -hmm. thanks to script talk and you guys, it's just I can't thank you enough. It's wonderful. That's great. I, I appreciate that. It's Darren, right? It's Derek. Derek. Okay. Thanks for calling in, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome. Um, I don't see any others, but is there anybody else out there? I have, can... have one other question. Okay. This is Joe again. Uh, you were saying in your presentation about uh, some local, maybe some local uh, pharmacy, maybe uh, using the script talk as well. Uh, could you could elaborate on that more? Yeah, absolutely. So not the veteran, all veterans have access to script talk. Uh, we also have a retail side of script talk to where civilian pharmacies are equipped to offer the service. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyone else? We can maybe take one more question. Okay. Well, going once. Going twice. Well, it looks like, like we're good. Um, Richie, thank you so much. No problem, Stuart. Thank, thank you so you. much for being with us and um, for the, the presentation and for all the support that Envision um, gives to BVA. And um, we'll look forward to meeting you in person and again also. When, can't wait. Hopefully, can't wait for that, that time to come. That's right. Um, so um, we'll go ahead and um, 
I'll cut this off now. We want to thank everyone who's participated and attended today. Um, we we kind of knew at this, but it's um, it seems like we're we're progressing a little bit as time goes on and um, making it better each time. Um, thanks to Dr. Cockerham also for his presentation and uh, look forward to seeing you on the next one. Um, hope we will have some more in the future. And so um, please uh, watch for the notices that might be sent out about other um, other sessions that we have, other of these educational sessions. Um, thanks very much and have a great rest of the, your white cane day. <laughs>